Let's begin tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to come together tonight for this parish mission. We ask in the name of Jesus for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. Just as it fell on the first disciples at Pentecost, so we pray for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit to come upon us tonight and tomorrow night and Tuesday night as we gather together just as they did in the upper room to pray in the company of Mary for the Holy Spirit, for the church. And so we crown you, Mary, the queen of this parish mission as we pray together. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John Fisher, pray for us. St. Patrick, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, everyone. As Father Steve said, I'm Father Jason Brooks. I'm a legionary of Christ stationed right here in the Detroit Archdiocese. I started a healing ministry last summer with some lay people, and so the Acts of the Apostles, especially Acts chapter 4, has been one of my favorite chapters uh, of late, and so I'm very excited for this opportunity to reflect with you uh, on Acts chapter 4. But really, before we get into chapter 4, I think we have to look at what happened in chapter 3, because it sets the stage for what happens in chapter 4. That makes sense, doesn't it? So, by way of review, in chapter 1 of Acts, the uh, ascension of Jesus happens. Remember that St. Luke is not only the author of his gospel, but he's also the author of, of Acts, okay? So then, in chapter 2, is the Pentecost event, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Something to note when we celebrate Pentecost, we celebrate the birthday of the church because it's when the apostles first went out on their own, you might say, without the presence of Jesus in their midst and preached the gospel. Peter was the leader of the band and he was going out. And the funny thing is about his first papal proclamation is that it went a little bit like this. Brothers and sisters, these men are not drunk as you suppose them to be, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. So they were acting rather silly. For some reason, well, the answer is they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with so much joy and power and boldness that people were scratching their heads and thinking they might be drunk. We haven't seen them act like this before. So something very special happened. It's not that they hadn't received the Holy Spirit at all, because they were baptized. The apostles themselves were ordained priests, and they had received the Eucharist at the Last Supper. So they clearly had the Holy Spirit, but what they didn't have were the, the gifts, the charismatic gifts that they needed to evangelize, to preach the gospel with boldness, with signs and wonders, with courage. So that's what they needed. That's why Jesus had them pray for those nine days from his ascension to Pentecost Sunday, the first novena of the church, so that they would receive this power from on high that enabled them to go out. So that's chapter 2. Let's read a little bit from chapter 3. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of those who entered the temple. 
Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked for alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him with John and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention upon them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or, and gold, but I give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. A miracle. A miracle that gets Peter and John in trouble. Because remember, the same religious leaders that had Jesus condemned and put to death, they're still around. And they don't want Peter and John and the apostles spreading the name of Jesus. They don't want the apostles preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. Because they, they know that they were guilty. They feel that shame, that guilt. They're afraid of losing their power, their influence. They were envious of Jesus. That's why they had him put to death. And now they're afraid that these men, who seem to have new power and new boldness, are going to do the same thing. So, fast forward. A little bit later, in chapter 3. Let's start with verse 17. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, Peter speaking to the crowd, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ should suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for establishing all that God spoke by the mouth of of his holy prophets from of old. Okay? Now we start with chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. The number of those who believed grew to about 5,000. On the next day, verse 5, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a cripple, by what means this man has been healed, be it known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, but which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That was verse 12. So we're going to stop there for tonight in terms of the reading. There's more to come. But Father Steve wanted to highlight that we have to believe this, and especially this verse 12. 
There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What does that mean? Let's unpack that a little bit. I, I brought up the catechism with me here. Number 432 from the catechism. The name Jesus signifies that the very name of God is present in the person of his Son, made man for the universal and definitive redemption from sins. It is the divine name that alone brings salvation. And henceforth, all can invoke his name. For Jesus united himself to all men through his incarnation. So that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So that's something that we can try to appreciate more. That God became a man. That's one of the unique things about Christianity. We don't believe that there's just a God out there somewhere that sees us, that knows us. But we believe that he actually became a human being. In fact, a baby born of a woman. And so that's been revealed to us. When we talk about believing all that we've heard, all that's been revealed to us, we're talking about a revelation of God. Our religion is a religion of revelation. It's important to remember that. That God has revealed himself to us. He did it in the times of the Old Testament before Jesus. In miraculous ways. The most miraculous way that God revealed himself and his power and his majesty was when he liberated the Israelites from the Egyptian slavery and led them through the Red Sea miraculously and then through the desert for 40 years, finally into the promised land. But Jews still celebrate the Passover when the angel of death in Egypt passed over all of the houses of the Israelites that were marked by the blood of the Lamb. And so that was all symbolic of what Jesus did for us on the cross. How he shed his own blood to save us from our sins and to give us new life. So Jesus came to not only save us, but you could say to heal us. To heal us from the effects of sin. And so we as Christians, although we still have to struggle with sin in our own lives, in our tendency to be self-centered, we believe that by the grace of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, little by little, we can be transformed, transfigured, as I was saying at Mass today. So let me just read another number here from the Catechism. Two numbers, in fact. This would be in the, the second part of the Catechism, how we worship and the sacraments of healing, especially the anointing of the sick. So number 1506 from the Catechism, 1506. Christ invites his disciples to follow him by taking up their cross in their turn. By following him, they acquire a new outlook on illness and the sick. Jesus associates them with his own life of poverty and service. The least of these, my brothers. He makes them share in his ministry of compassion and healing, his disciples. He makes them share, he invites them, is probably a better way to say it, he invites them to share in his ministry of compassion and healing. We'll be talking more about that in the next couple days. So they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. And not just physically, but spiritually. The effects of sin. We all suffer the effects of sin. Not just original sin, but our own personal sin 
and the sin that happens around us. It leaves its mark. But it's not a permanent one. (laughs) We're not identified by our sins. The devil would like to do that. He would like to accuse us, because that's what Satan means, the accuser. He would like to point his finger at us and accuse us, shame us, so that we would identify ourselves by the things that have happened to us and by the things that we've done that were sinful. But that's not how God sees us. Let's read number 1507. The risen Lord renews this mission. In my name they will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover and confirms it through the signs that the church performs by invoking his name. These signs demonstrate in a special way that Jesus is truly God who saves and God who heals. And Peter and John demonstrated that when they healed that crippled man who is over 40 years old. So everybody knew that that was a sign, that was a miracle, and they did it in the name of Jesus by the power that they received from Jesus and the Father, the Holy Spirit. And we, dear brothers and sisters, we've received that same spirit, that same authority has been given to us by God himself. We share in this mission. We share, all of us, not just the priests, but we all share in this mission to make the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, present. I like what a friend of mine likes to say, and that is, God didn't just send his son to die for us and rise from the dead and go to the Father and send us the Spirit just so that we could get to heaven. Of course, we all want to go to heaven. Amen? But there's more. There's more to our lives than just getting to heaven. God actually wants us to make the kingdom of heaven present here and now throughout our lives to save everyone. Not just a few. He wants everyone to be saved. And in some mysterious way, he entrusts that to you and me. We all have a part to play in that. St. Augustine likes to say that. Well, he said it, right? (laughs) He died about 1,600 years ago. But he would say that God created us without us. God created us by himself, right? Out of love. Not because he had to, but because he wanted to. But he didn't want to save us and redeem us without our participation. Without our collaboration. So we become co-workers, collaborators with Christ. In the salvation of souls, in the establishment of his kingdom. Here and now. I see my friend Tim out there, big fan of the divine will, right? When we pray the Our Father, thy kingdom come, you could say in parentheses, here and now, on earth, as it is in heaven, as it is in heaven. So God wants heaven to come down, to be experienced by all of us here and now. Not completely, obviously, not fully, but to taste it. There's even a psalm that says, taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Taste and see the goodness of the Lord. So God wants to be known. He's revealed himself fully in Jesus Christ. He wants to be known. He wants us to have a relationship with him. Jesus chose to stay with us and to accompany us all through time in the Blessed Sacrament, in the Eucharist. 
So we have him in our midst, and we're all temples of the Holy Spirit. We've all been baptized and have received the very Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, which, as St. Paul says, allows us to cry out, Abba, Father, which makes us sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. So we're called to believe this. One of my favorite numbers from the Catechism, number 142, talks about this faith. By his revelation, the invisible God, from the fullness of his love, addresses men as his friends and moves among them in order to invite and receive them into his own company. So that's what that's another way of saying that we've been baptized into Christ, that we are now members of his household. As I like to say during the Mass, our citizenship is in heaven. So he has received us into his own company. The adequate response to this invitation is faith. Faith. So we have to make acts of faith when this is revealed to us. Amen? And even just an amen is a short act of faith. It's it's a way of saying, yes, I believe. That's true. (laughs) I come into agreement with that. I come into agreement with that in the name of Jesus. So I'll get us practicing that here tonight at the end. So see the the dynamic here. God reveals himself, and we respond in faith. And as we do that, God confirms it with signs and wonders. Now you might be saying to yourself, I don't know if I've ever seen a sign or a wonder in my life, Father Jason. Maybe you haven't. But I think if, if we all think about it, We have experienced God in our lives. The little miracles of every day. The way he reveals himself to us in a sunrise. In one another. Through his word. Through those coincidences that just seem to happen throughout the day. Which we believers would call providence. God's providence, the way he provides for us. You see that the word provide is in providence? Some people never think about that. But we believe in God's providence, that God provides for us. And when he does, we should say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for providing for me. Thank you for watching out for me. I got a funny story. How God revealed himself to a young man when I was flying one time. This is years ago. I was a younger, much younger priest. And it was uh, one of these economy airlines where we didn't have an assigned seat. And I get there pretty late. And so I just decided to be the last person on the plane. So I'm there, waiting there in the gate. Last call. I get up. I'm the last one on the plane. And I'm guessing that I'm going to have to sit way in the back between two other people, probably across from the bathroom or something, right? When to my pleasant surprise, there was an empty seat in about the fourth row right on the aisle. And as I'm looking down at this seat in disbelief, the man in the middle said to me, yeah, Father, this is an open seat. Have a seat. If you don't mind being surrounded by some of my noisy kids and I was like, no, that's good. We're not going to Australia. You know, it was just about an hour flight to Connecticut, I think. So that man wanted to talk to a Catholic priest that week. He had been raised Catholic, fell away, got reintroduced to Jesus in the military. So he had a lot of questions. So God provided for him when I sat down next to him. But the story gets better because we keep talking and He said, hey, Father, I'd like to pray with you when we deploy with my whole family. I said, sure, I'll wait for you in the gate. 
So we land, I did plane immediately, and I'm just standing there waiting for this family to come off the plane. When the young man who was sitting directly in front of me, who was not related to this family, he comes up to me, white as a ghost. He says, hey, Father, I, I just got to tell you something. I was sitting in front of you today, and, and, uh, but, but before I got on the plane, I said a prayer. Because the last time I flew, one of the engines caught fire, and we nearly crashed. And so my prayer was, Lord, could you, could you just give me a sign to show me that you got my back? And then you came and sat down right behind me. I just said, praise God. And he couldn't believe it. But God was showing this young man and, and reminding me that he hears our prayers. Even the simplest little prayer like that. God hears those prayers. And he likes to answer them. And he likes it when we acknowledge when they're answered. And when we do acknowledge it, what happens? Our faith grows. Our faith increases. Just like anything, right? How is it that you get faster and stronger? You got to exercise, right? We're not going to get faster or stronger. I mean, I'm not getting any faster or stronger, that's for sure. But when we're younger, right, we exercise and we get faster and stronger. It's the same thing with faith. We have to exercise it, make acts of faith, and then it grows. It grows. So I've been ordained a priest for almost 20 years. So you might think, oh, Father has lots of faith. Like, why does he need more? But I want more. Because it helps me to exercise my ministry with even greater impact, greater power. And so in the last couple of years, my faith has grown. I attended a school of healing, the Encounter School of Healing. And I was challenged to pray for healing. And guess what? I saw people get healed. <laughs> I was like, whoa. And so as I saw my friends pray for healing for other people, and, and I'd see those people get healed, and then as I prayed for healing and saw people get healed, my faith it increased. That seems pretty logical, right? Like, wow. But I had to test it. I had to step out in faith. Is everyone healed when I pray for them? No. God knows why. But some people are. I was just talking to my, my mom today on the phone and her friend Donna in Connecticut. Roughly a year ago, I prayed for Donna over the phone. She was in level 8 pain from battling cancer. She had sarcoma cancer, very aggressive form of cancer. I pray for Donna over the phone. By the time we hang up, her pain is completely gone. Zero. And the next time she went for a cancer checkup, there was no trace of cancer. And just recently, there was something that they found. I don't know all the details, but she was nervous. We prayed again. She was sweating. Again, we were just praying over the phone. She's like, Father, I never sweat. She's like, I am dripping. And she told my mom later, I had to take a shower. I was sweating so much. And that was the Holy Spirit. That was the fire of the Holy Spirit coming down on Donna. And so whatever she had, she went for her checkup and there's nothing. She got a clear scan again. No cancer. Praise God, right? Praise God. And Amanda, who's the parishioner here, we prayed for her. She gave her testimony here. Prayed for her right over there last year. Her husband Jason was with her. She had all kinds of stuff going on. Migraines, all kinds of joint pain, rheumatoid arthritis. She said the same thing. She started sweating here. She was sweating for three days, she said. And it's like it just all came out of her. And she's been healed ever since. No migraines, no joint pain, nothing. Ask her if she's not a happier camper today. Ask her if her, her faith didn't increase when she prayed for healing and it happened. And just as I tell that story, what happens here in the room? 
You're like, I want to see that. I believe. I want to see it too. Right? At least I hope that's the response. We should not be skeptical. The things that happened in the Bible, the things that Peter and James and John did, God wants all of us to do. And sure, some people have very special anointing for healing or whatever it might be. But listen to what Jesus said in Mark's gospel. At the end of Mark's gospel, chapter 16. Let me start with verse 15, Mark 16, 15. And he, Jesus, said to them, his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs, verse 17, will accompany those who believe. Do you believe? Who believes? Everybody. So these signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. The gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't make it up. It's, it's right there in the Bible. <laughs> I'm not making this up. You can read it for yourself tonight. Mark 16, 17. So this is good news. This is good news. This is exciting. My priesthood has gotten so much more exciting in the last couple years. Because now I don't just say, oh, I'll pray for you. When someone comes up to me and says, oh, Father, you know, I, I'm in level 8 pain. Can you pray for me? Yeah, I'll remember you at Mass or in my rosary. I mean, that's nothing wrong with that. But let's pray right here, right now for your healing. Because Jesus said we should do that. So I'm not just praying for people later. I'm praying for them right here, right now. I prayed for a woman this afternoon who had all kinds of scar tissue in her lungs and a cough, arthritis, and she's, she wasn't, you know, middle-aged, not like, you know, 90 years old. And so she felt this great peace come upon her. She, she felt like this very strong breath come into her she pretty much stopped coughing when she was there and she she did cough but she's like it feels different like stuff is actually breaking up inside of me so i was like praise god and we, we were just praying over her for the spirit she was crying she was feeling the love of god all around her she was being touched by god by the spirit of god and that's what we want to pray for, even tonight and, and, and tomorrow, and, and especially Tuesday when we have adoration and prayer teams here. So if you know people who need healing, bring them Tuesday night, because we're going to have all kinds of prayer teams here, and we're going for it. We're going for it. And if you've got something going on, we're going to pray for healing Tuesday night. And I have an expectation for miracles. Because I've seen it over and over and over again. So now my level of faith is higher. And so I pray for that for all of you. When Father Steve is asking us to believe it, to believe that in the name of Jesus we are saved, and we're not just saved, but we're actually now something new. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, was it the same body that he died with? I mean, yes and no, right? It was, it was Jesus, it was his body, but it was a glorified body. A glorified body. He could walk through locked doors. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to walk through a locked door? Yeah, right? Of course, that's like, that'd be awesome. That would be awesome. And so... He did that to show us that there's something new about this new life that he rose to and gave to us. He gave it. We don't have to earn it. You don't have to be a super saint to pray for healing. You don't have to be a super saint to be healed. 
It's not about if you're worthy or not. Because who's worthy, really? I mean, if we're worthy, it's because Jesus has made us worthy. Jesus has made us worthy. 1 Corinthians 5. I got that wrong. Anyway, I know how to pair. It's uh, here we go. It's two Corinthians five. Excuse me, two Corinthians five twenty one. I'll start with twenty. Two Corinthians five twenty. So we are ambassadors for Christ. That's a great, great thing to to claim. Let's let's declare that out loud right now in faith. Repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, I believe that I am an ambassador for Christ. God making his appeal through me. Isn't that cool? That's awesome. I love that. Paul goes on. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him... We might become the righteousness of God. Let me, let me repeat that one again. Verse 21, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So God is doing all of that for us. That's the long and the short of that. God is doing all of that for us. So we don't have to earn it. It's not about whether or not we deserve it. It's not about the results we get or how we perform. It's not about that. It's about him. And it's about us believing in what he said and in, and in what he did and in what he still does. I shared a, a paradigm at Mass today, and it was about our identity in Christ. And I said, the world preaches that we do things so that we can have things, and that defines us. That's who we are in the eyes of the world. We do, we have, we are. Well, as I mentioned, that's exhausting. That's exhausting, because then we always have to perform. We always have to get good results to be good. Who wants to do that? Raise your hand. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's a trick question. Right? No, I don't want to do that. Because that instills a lot of fear and anxiousness. But rather, God tells us, you are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. And you have access to everything in my house. And that allows you to do the works of God. And even greater ones. But there's another paradigm that I want to close with tonight to bring about the renewal of our minds to help us believe even more deeply, even more profoundly and passionately. So it goes like this. It's very much related to the other pattern or paradigm that I shared. So here is... Here's not what the gospel teaches, but I think it's what a lot of us grew up with or have understood because of the world that we live in. Remember, the world says, I do, I have, and I am. And so then we take the gospel and we, we, we put that paradigm or that pattern over the gospel. And we read the gospel through that lens, through that worldly lens. So then we think the gospel is behave, I better behave, I better follow all the rules, and I better believe because God said so, so that I can belong, so that I can get to heaven. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Right? I got to do this, and I got to believe that, so that I can get to heaven. That's not the gospel. That is not the gospel. 
what's the gospel? Let's take those lenses off. Let's, I'm taking off my lenses. I can still kind of see. So I'm taking off those worldly lenses. And now I want to read the gospel the way Jesus wants me to read it. Because what did he come down and say? I, I said it earlier. You are mine. I will be your God and you will be my people. Which is a way of saying, you belong to me. When you were baptized, remember I said that you were claimed by God, through God, in the power of the Holy Spirit. So you belong to God because he says so, because he made it happen. So we already belong, and we believe because he has revealed himself. He has shown himself. To us and we experience it through the power of the Holy Spirit and that enables us to behave or to do the works of God but so many people you know I see it as a priest they feel like they have to behave better and try harder so that they can be better more lovable more worthy of heaven. It doesn't work that way. We have to seek God in faith, in spirit, and in truth, yes. But as we do that, he's the one that transforms us and allows us to move from grace to grace. He transfigures us. He transforms us. He's the one that makes us holy. We can't be holy without him. And we don't earn that holiness. We don't earn that transformation. It's a gift that we have to believe and approach in spirit and in truth. But it's given. It's not earned. We, again, we have to do our part. And you're doing your part. Here you are tonight. We're doing our part, Lord. Here we are. Now come. We invite you to come. We invite you to come in power and glory. We ask you, Lord, to reveal yourself to us more and more. Okay, let's make some acts of faith together to close tonight. In the name of Jesus, I believe that I'm a child of God. In the name of Jesus, I believe, I believe that, my is in that my citizenship is in heaven and I have access, I have access to, everything to everything in the Father's house that allows me, that allows me to do the works of God. Works of God. Amen. Amen. And let's pray. Come Holy, Come Holy Spirit. Yeah, repeat after me. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on me. Help me to be aware of your presence right here, right now. I believe I'm a temple of the Holy Spirit. I believe that you are with me. I believe that you are for me. Come Holy Spirit. I need you. I'm desperate for you. I invite you to come. And I expect you to come. Not because of my merits. Not because of who I am. But because of who you are. And because of what you've done for me. And what you want to do. For me. And with me. And through me. And in me. Come Holy Spirit. Just rest for a minute, be quiet. Notice, notice what you feel. Notice your thoughts. Notice your imagination right now. Notice your emotions. Notice your intuition. In other words, try to get in touch with your interior senses. You sense the presence of God. Maybe there's a peace right now. 
that you're experiencing that you haven't felt in a long time. Maybe you, maybe you experience a kind of encouragement or, or affirmation of who you are, a sense of, of your dignity, a renewed sense of your dignity, your preciousness in the eyes of God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit at work, touching your heart, your soul, your spirit, your mind, your body. His Spirit touching your spirit, manifesting in your presence here. Anybody feel it or sense it in some way? Yeah? It's okay. <laughs> yeah. I was feeling getting lit up here. I feel like tingling, you know, like goosebumps. It's different for everybody. It'll be personal. But the more we ask, the more we desire, the more he will respond, the more he'll give. So let us pray in thanksgiving together here tonight for all that we've received. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.